so Kant's book called The Groundwork uh, for the, of the Metaphysics of Morals um, was written after The Creek of Pure Reason. And uh, this is, this is another big contribution that Kant makes to philosophy now in the area of ethics. And so he wants to, he wants to approach ethics from a metaphysical perspective. Um, and of course, empiricists have a hard time uh, developing ethics, you know, what are the principles of morality from an empirical perspective? That, that's kind of hard. Now, Hume goes a long way to try to, to he has a book on uh, ethics, and he tries to reconstruct ethics um, in a very sort of conventional way so that people are Lead, led to behave in conventional manners um, on em, empiricist sort of grounds. Um, uh, but there is something a little dissatisfying about Hume's treatment. Uh, he thought of it as a groundbreaking work and his greatest accomplishment, but I, I don't really think that's true. And it's basically a rehashing of Aristotelian uh, or Aristotle's approach to ethics in many ways, just sort of set within uh, British culture. Uh, and, and it is highly ethnocentric. Um, Kant tries to do something that is not ethnocentric, that is universal in scope and is not about etiquette and custom, but is really about maintaining the dignity of every human being. So it's a, there's something um, very important here and, um, and it's part of this sort of project of defining inalienable rights. And so I wanna, I wanna try to explain that real briefly here. Um, what he comes up with in the groundwork uh, of the metaphysics of morals is the categorical imperative. And so the categorical imperative, and it's categorical because it is, it refers to all people, the whole universe of people. It's the whole category of, of people and, and, and everybody must uh, conform to the categorical imperative. That's what is meant by morality and duty is that everybody has to get on board with it uh, and he sees that as the very central notion of ethics, just in, in broad terms. And then what is the categorical imperative? And he has three different formulations. The first formulation is that, that of ver universality and the law of nature. Okay, so, so this ties into like what we saw with John Locke in his discussion of the state of nature and the law of nature, Kant wants to put his categorical imperative in those terms. And the way that that comes out is in this statement. So this is a quote from Kant, act as if the maxims of your action were to become through your will, a universal law of nature. Okay, and there's a, another formulation that, that, that isn't specifically about the law of nature, still understood as this first formulation. But I like this law of nature formula formulation. Um, and I like to use the example of a movie called Liar Liar. And in this movie, um, John Kerry's the, the main actor in it. And John Kerry is a, uh, he's a lawyer. And, uh, and he, of course, and it's a comedy, okay. So and and so there's stereotypes involved here, but uh, but so John Kerry, as a lawyer, obviously lies a lot. He lies in court. He lies to his uh, his ex-wife. 
and he lies to his son. And that's where the, it really cuts, uh, is that he finds himself lying to his son and his son finds his dad lying to him. And so the son, when it's his birthday, um, when he blows out the candle, he wishes that his dad could not lie. Uh, and so magically through this birthday wish, John Kerry is compelled, or Jim Carrey, sorry, the character of, of Jim Carrey is compelled to tell the truth like mechanically like there's a law of nature that makes him tell the truth in every circumstance for 24 hours. And of course, he being a lawyer, hijinks ensue. He has, to, he has a big case in which his whole strategy is based on a big lie. And, um, and so he gets into all these uh, awkward situations and comically resolves them. And you can, you know, it's a fairly predictable story. The, the moral of the story is that, you know, he should learn to tell the truth all the time, uh, not only under this birthday wish compulsion. Um, but what I wanna do is now with that same sort of narrative thinking, not that in reality, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes students have trouble getting into the hypothetical of this, but it's just like the Jim Carrey film, Liar, Liar. But instead of the boy wishing that his dad would always tell the truth, let's suppose there's a, another situation in which the boy wishes or someone wishes that Jim Carrey, that character would always lie in every circumstance that they would always lie in every circumstance. And let's take it a little further and say that somebody could wish within this narrative, this, this hypothetical story, just conceive of it. Uh, suppose that somebody were to wish that everyone in the world had to lie in every circumstance for 24 hours. What would happen? Think about it. Suppose that every doctor had to always lie to their patients, that the surgeon had to always lie to his, his, uh, his assistants in the surgery room, that every police officer had to lie to everyone that they interacted with, that every stockbroker had to always lie about every stock trade they were making or negotiating, that every air traffic controller had to lie in every circumstance to every pilot that they spoke to. And this is just everyone is lying simultaneously to everybody about everything. And we can see that, um, you know, we can imagine a movie like that where it's very apocalyptic and this is the, you know, the, the world disintegrates and maybe goes up in a nuclear holocaust uh, within those 24 hours. What this demonstrates for Kant is that, um, is that you couldn't, institute lying as a law of nature. And, and what we see here is that lying, when we lie, we trade upon the fact that fairly universal, universally, most of the time, people are telling the truth. And lies only work because the background is a background in which people usually tell the truth but you can't have a background in which everybody lies. So there's a clear conceptual difference. There's a difference between telling the truth and lying. We could imagine somebody wishing that everybody told the truth all the time in every circumstance for 24 hours and the world might turn out incredibly better over in a 24 hour period, right? Um, but lying doesn't work. 
And, and so Kant says the categorical imperative of ethics is that you have to uh, take as your principle of action, your maxim, your, your, your axiom, like, you know, your synthetic a priori idea of what you should do, you want to think, you want that to meet this test. Could I make my synthetic a priori principle of ethical action, could I, if I had the magical power to do so, make it a universal law of nature so that everybody was compelled to follow that principle? If you could have everybody follow that principle, then it's good. If you couldn't have everybody follow that principle, just in terms of mechanics, like the way uh, I described that rendition of the liar liar uh, story, then it's not a, a genuine ethical principle. Uh, that's interesting. And, and we have to agree, you know, in large part with what he's saying here. Um, the second formulation is the formulation of humanity, which really gets at this inalienable rights thing. Uh, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, as an instrument to reach your particular purposes, but always at the same time as an end, that you're doing things for yourself and treating your humanity with dignity, but also doing things in such a way that you treat everybody else's person with dignity. And so think about your principle of ethics, your a priori synthetic principle. Does it, does it embody or, or suggest that every single human being has the same dignity that you in your own person have? And are you treating yourself with dignity as a human being? Um, and so we're looking for the good of everyone simultaneously. So the category, categorical imperative has to have that characteristic. Um, and so here, the connection with inalienable rights, and very much connected to things that Locke said in those uh, sections that I read, especially um, in the last two sections that I read uh, out of chapter 11. Um, you know, no one has the right to infringe upon the life, liberty, or property of another. And you can't give away the, your own right to life, liberty, and property to some higher power, like the legislature. Um, uh, this second formulation fits very nicely with what Locke was saying. Um, see that, that, or that Kant is very much engaged with empiricism and with Locke in particular. And, you know, he's shown the importance of getting into this conversation by Hume. Okay. So third formulation is autonomy, the idea of the will of every rational being as a universal legislating will that um, when you concoct in your mind, a principle of your action, like a rule to follow for your action, your maxim, you have to think of yourself as a legislator, like in the way that, Con uh, that Locke was talking about. And you have to think, when I act according to a principle, I am legislating my own life and I have to respect my own life, liberty and property uh, but I also have to think that I'm also legislating for everybody else. Otherwise, my rule is not a good rule. And would I want other people to follow the same rule? And I have to constantly be conscious of this legislative um, autonomy that respects my own personal free will to make choices 
and also respect the ability uh, and, and inherent nature of other people to make their own choices. And, um, and so whatever I come up with as a rule has to be something that everybody else would agree to and would choose for themselves. Uh, so we're respecting free will and the rational choice of others. We're respecting their inalienable rights as human beings. And we're considering, is it possible to institute this as a law of nature. If we mechanically forced everybody to follow the rule, would that work out? Or would it you know, collapse in some kind of disaster? Um, okay, so I wanna uh, leave that at that. So this is the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. And if you, you know, more about this in philosophy 102, um, you know, usually, you know, every professor will spend a good amount of time on, on Kant's uh, categorical imperative.